Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Dan Album, a senior attorney at the Institute of Justice, an organization that frequently handles civil forfeiture cases. Since gamblers can find themselves in a civil forfeiture situation, we've, invad- we've invited Dan on the air to talk to us. Dan Albin, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you very much. To get started, what is civil forfeiture and how prevalent is it in this country? Well, civil forfeiture is when law enforcement uh, seizes property, often cash, And um, instead of filing criminal charges to forfeit the cash, they attempt to forfeit the cash in civil court. And that means the owner of the cash is not entitled to all of the rights that a criminal defendant would receive. And if they lose their case, uh, the government gets to keep the money. Uh, It is extremely prevalent in the United States at both the the federal and and state level, uh, approximately $2 $2 billion every year are forfeited by the federal government and even more by uh, state and local law enforcement agencies. So it's a, it's a very large and uh, a common problem that people encounter. What is it that the Institute of Justice does? Well, the Institute for Justice is a nonprofit. Oh, the Institute for Justice. Uh-huh. I apologize. Yeah. No problem. The Institute for Justice is a nonprofit public interest law firm. We do constitutional cases challenging governmental abuse at the local, state, and federal level. And we litigate cases in four main areas, which are property rights, economic liberty, free speech, and educational choice. And our litigation about civil forfeiture falls under our property rights pillar, And we represent um, dozens of victims of civil forfeiture who had property seized, even though they, in most cases, are never even charged with a crime and are trying to get their money back, usually um, life savings or their car or even in some cases their home, because the police say there is some connection between a crime, often a crime that that person didn't commit, and uh, and the property that the police want to seize. And so based on probable cause, police seize the property, and then um, the owner of the property is, uh, has the burden of trying to um, litigate to get their property back. And that can be very expensive, can be very time-consuming, and we represent all of our clients pro bono for free. We never charge any of our clients uh, a dime, and we are funded entirely by donations, uh, not from our clients, but from other people. Um, About 8,000 individuals each year donate to the Institute for Justice, and they make up about 80% of our annual budget, and the remaining 20% comes from donations from foundations. And so the way we operate is we do what's called strategic impact litigation. We bring cases uh, not because we um, just want to help the the client in, in that individual case, but because we want to make an impact through the litigation. We want to set precedent that makes it more difficult for police in the future to seize and forfeit property. And so uh, part of our um, litigation goals in the area of civil forfeiture, ultimately we'd love to end civil forfeiture altogether. Uh, But in in the sort of short term, we're looking to do it incrementally by representing um, you know, people who are in these cases who have had their money seized, challenging everything from the probable cause for the seizure in the first place to the lack of a prompt post-seizure hearing to the profit incentive that police often have when they seize property because in most jurisdictions uh, you get to keep what you seize and we think that um, distorts priorities and violates due process. And also uh, we challenge forfeitures based on Uh, being an excessive fine. And just last year, litigated a case in the U.S. Supreme Court where we won 9-0 on behalf of uh, a man named Tyson Timms, 
who had a Land Rover seized because he, um, he was convicted of selling about $300 worth of drugs out of the car. And um, the police, in a separate action, tried to use civil forfeiture to forfeit the Land Rover. And uh, judges in Indiana said, no, 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 that seems a little excessive compared to the maximum fine he, he could face. And he was only sentenced to um, something like $1,200 in fines and uh, five years of probation. Uh, it seems a little extreme to forfeit someone's $42,000 Land Rover over this minor of a crime. Uh, but the Indiana Supreme Court said, uh, sorry, the excessive fines clause from the United States Constitution doesn't apply to the states. It only applies to the federal government. And um, we challenged that, took it up to the Supreme Court, and 9-0, to zero, the Supreme Court said, oh, yes, it does apply to the states, just like nearly every other provision of the Bill of Rights. Um, so we litigate in a variety of areas related to civil forfeiture, uh, representing all of our clients for free with the ultimate goal of trying to end civil forfeiture altogether. You mentioned uh, probable cause. Um, mm -hmm. We've had several guests on our show have had this problem happen. One of them in particular, I remember, uh, was pulled over for driving the speed limit, and the cop told him that that was suspicious because nobody drives the speed limit. So... Um, I guess my question is, what, what are the best things that our audience can do to try to avoid this and protect themselves in these cases? Sure. Um, well, there is only so much you can do uh, if, a, if a police officer is determined to find probable cause, because police officers can uh, basically generate probable cause on their own, either through um, dishonesty or, or simply being suspicious. Um, so, yeah, you, you will see cases where someone driving under the speed limit is considered suspicious, uh, cases where someone driving exactly the speed limit is considered suspicious, and of course, driving over the speed limit is a basis for pulling someone over for speeding. Um, so all of so those long have you avoid all three of those. You're fine, right? It, well, <laughs> yes. Or don't and don't fly and don't do any number of other things that could trigger a potential uh, seizure. That said, there there are some uh, good guidelines you can follow. Um, for one thing, uh, don't ever consent to a search of your car or um, your person, your belongings, your uh, your room, your your home. Um, even if you're confident that there is absolutely uh, nothing that the police would find that, that would uh, incriminate you in any way, you should never consent uh, to a search because um, things that are totally innocuous can be uh, misinterpreted as um, somehow indicative of something criminal, and things that are totally legal to have, like uh, you know stacks of cash, uh, can be seized uh, on that basis. And... Um, you can save yourself, potentially save yourself, a fair bit of trouble by not consenting to the search. Now, that, that's not going to uh, be a foolproof way of, uh, of not being searched. If police can identify uh, a source of probable cause to search you, then it doesn't matter whether you've consented to the search or not. But there's no reason to make it easy for them and, and just consent to the search. Um, so that, that would be probably the first thing. The second thing is most criminal defense attorneys recommend not ever talking to the police, ever. Um, and that includes even when you're very sure that you're not the one um, that they're investigating, uh, because if you talk to the police, things can get distorted and they can use what you say uh, against you in ways that are um, <laughs> often very eye-opening. Um, the police are allowed to lie to you, uh, despite what many people think, and, so, and mislead you. And so they can approach you uh, as though they are investigating someone else or looking into uh, something totally unrelated to you, as far as you know. And it may just be a pretext for getting information from you that they think is sufficient to um, justify probable cause and, and um, you know, search your person, your car, your home, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, the third thing is, um, it's important to know that... Um, Before we go on to the third thing... Sure. Um, you're stopped by a police who wants your... The first thing they ask for is license and registration. 
Yes. So you're saying hand, hand these over quietly. Sure. But not say a word. Yeah, ideally. Um, I mean, that's what most criminal defense attorneys recommend. I, I don't think it's harmful to um, say something like, sure, give me a moment, or my registration is in my glove box, can I get it out, things like that. Um, uh-huh. But anything substantive can be used against you. And police will often try to engage you in conversation and try to ask questions. A very common tactic is to sort of turn a a pretty routine traffic stop into a drug interrogation. And that can go with any number of things, that can begin with any number of things, but often it's something like, hey, where are you headed today? Uh, You know, uh, where are you coming from? Um, Why are you uh, driving at this hour? Um, uh, I see that uh, you have license plates from X state, is that where you're from? Uh, What brings you to this state? you know, pretty common um, conversation starters. And for most people, it's pretty instinctual to respond to that the same way you would a normal person. But what the police officer is actually doing is gathering information, gathering evidence that could be used as the basis for probable cause. And so, um, you know, they're trying to find out, are you going from what they would call a known uh, drug trafficking um, location, like a large city, to another large drug trafficking location, another large city. And they probably already know that you're on what they would call a drug trafficking corridor if you're on an interstate or major highway. Um, So they will use that information as pieces of the picture that they want to paint to justify probable cause. So it's best to say, it's best to say, you know, I, you know, either not say anything at all or, you know, uh, I'd prefer not to answer that. Here's the information I'm required to provide to you. Um, and if they keep pressing you, you can say, am I free to leave? Um, and if they say no, you should probably say, well, I'd like, uh, before I answer your question, I'd like to talk to an attorney. And you can be very friendly and calm and polite about that. Police understand what's going on. They, they know. Um, so you can tell them, look, I, I don't want to um, talk about anything else besides what you need to process this traffic stop. Uh, here's my driver's license, here's my registration, let me know if you need anything else. And you know, if they do ask for anything else and it seems you know, something besides like you know, the rental car information or something like that, um, you know, that's when you want to decline to provide the information and ask to speak to an attorney. Okay, okay. and now uh, back to your third uh, thing. Sure. Uh, So the third thing that's important for people to know, and uh, I suspect folks who um, are sort of in the gambling industry are familiar with this, but um, it is legal to travel with any amount of cash uh, domestically, and it is also legal to travel with any amount of cash internationally. But if you leave the United States uh, or enter the United States with more than $10,000, you need to declare that to customs before you depart. And there's a form that you can do that. It's available online. Um, If you have more than $10,000, you you need to report the money as you're leaving. It's not illegal to leave with more than $10,000, but it is illegal to leave with more than $10,000 if you have not reported it. That restriction only applies to international travel. There is no limit on what you can take within the United States. And it's perfectly legal to have more than $10,000, not declare it to TSA or whomever else you might think you would need to declare it to so long as you're traveling domestically. All of that said, it's often a good idea to have um, information uh, supporting where the cash came from with the cash. So, for example, if you um, withdraw cash from a casino, you typically get the receipt and paperwork from that, especially if it's a transaction over $10,000. And it would be good to keep that information with the cash so that if officers do uh, you know, find probable cause to search you and they find the cash and the cash matches what's on the receipt and the receipt you know, has the name of a casino on it, they can, go, uh, they, they can be assured that that is the source of the cash and may decide not to seize it. It's certainly not foolproof. Um, but it at least is a very relevant piece of information that if the, case, if the cash is seized, your attorney will be very happy uh, that you did that and, and, uh, and have that information with the cash, and in many cases will prevent the cash from being seized at all, because they'll look at it, they'll say, oh, okay, so this is, this is where that's from. 
Um, one other uh, point of information that I think people get mistaken a lot about the $10,000 limit is people know that when you make a transaction of over $10,000, either with a casino or with a bank or any other financial institution, uh, that transaction gets reported to the government, uh, to, uh, to an entity um, kind of connected to the IRS. Uh, so occasionally people will deliberately um, try to avoid making a transaction over $10,000 to avoid that reporting requirement. Usually that reporting requirement, by the way, doesn't involve you doing paperwork. It's usually the bank uh, employee or the casino employee or, or whomever else you're dealing with. They have to fill out an extra form reporting the transaction to the government. It's possible you'll have to sign it or look at it, but generally you don't have to do too much. It might take a little bit of extra time while you wait for the bank teller to fill it out. Um, but it, you know, these days it can be done electronically and it, it probably won't be much of a burden. However, what people may not understand is it is illegal to deliberately structure your transactions to avoid the $10,000 reporting requirement. So if you would like to withdraw, say $15,000, and instead of just going and withdrawing $15,000 and having the currency transaction report filed with the government, you go and you draw $7,000 in the morning and $8,000 in the afternoon or you know, $7,500 one day and $7,500 the next. If the purpose of that is to avoid the reporting requirement, that is structuring and it is illegal under federal law. It could be prosecuted, but it very commonly forms the basis for a seizure of people's cash. And we've represented many, many small businesses who had cash seized because the IRS thought they were structuring their transactions. What they were actually doing was depositing the day's receipts at the end of the day because these businesses were grocery stores, gas stations, things like that, uh, didn't want to keep cash uh, at the business overnight, and so every day they would send money to the bank. And so their you know, um, bank account looked like a series of deposits, uh, you know, $4,000 one day, $7,000 the next, $3,000, $2,000, $9,000, etc. It looked like they were trying to avoid the $10,000 reporting requirement. I think um, everyday folks uh, may be aware of the $10,000 reporting requirement, um, should not, not structure their transactions to avoid that reporting requirement. It will get you in serious trouble and could get your money forfeited. So just withdraw whatever amount you want to withdraw, deposit whatever amount you want to deposit, um, and do not split up larger or smaller um, transactions in ways that would avoid uh, the reporting requirement. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I want to make a couple of points. Um, sure. Our audience, our audience is very familiar with um, cash transaction reports um, and uh, one thing, uh, they never have you, the individual, or at least in my experience, they do not have you sign uh, anything when they fill out a CTR. And in fact, they are not even allowed to tell you that they are doing it. Um, I, another thing is when you withdraw a large amount of money from a casino, um, whatever it is, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, um, yep. there, there is no paperwork. They don't give you any receipt that said that you won it um, unless you won it on a slot machine or video poker where there's a W2G form. But if you're a table games player, there are no forms there. Uh, your point is important, though. Any documentation that you can have um, is good, and um, many of our uh, listeners do things like bring a copy of their tax return that shows they are a professional gambler. Sure. Um, and the other thing is some of them carry a copy of a letter from an attorney that says, my client is a professional gambler. He carries a large amount of cash um, mm -hmm. and, you know, those kind of details. So uh, that, that's another possibility. Uh, if you sure. are withdrawing uh, from a bank, then you can ask them for some kind of receipt or whatever. That would be good to have. And on the structuring front, um, something that I have done in the past is uh, the opposite of structuring. I have made it a point to deposit or withdraw over $10,000 so that I can show a history of not trying to structure. 
<laughs> if yes. I have these things done in the past, then the idea that I would somehow be avoiding it this time at least can be argued. That I, yeah, that no, I, that's I, a very I, wise thing to do. And I think the, the items you mentioned with the tax returns and the letter from the attorney are wise precautions that you can take. Of course, nothing I'm suggesting or, or your tips will, will be foolproof and, a, and an absolute protection against a seizure. But the more of those kinds of things you do, the, the better position you put yourself in for an officer to decide, ah, it's probably not worth doing this, the guy's got an attorney, or you know, it seems like there is you know, a basis for him to have uh, the cash. If you can get a receipt from a casino when you do with withdrawal, try to. I mean, ask them for it. Um, it may be available in some circumstances, not in others. Um, the banks uh, have sort of changed how they've done business over the years. It used to be very common for bank tellers to actually advise people not to make a deposit or withdrawal over $10,000 because it created extra paperwork for them. Now, they're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed to say any of that, but that was, we, we've had a number of clients for whom that happened um, as recently as you know, in the past five to 10 years sometimes. And maybe it's due to poor training at some of the banks. Um, who, knows, who knows what the, the basis of it is. But um, <laughs> you can have a very different experience at, at different banks. But uh, my point is try to document the source of the money as best you can. And yeah, I think ha having things like tax returns or a letter from an attorney are a good idea. Definitely don't come close to structuring. Don't make a series of deposits that are $9,000 or something like that. Um, because that is going to be the sort of thing that's really going to trigger a lot of extra scrutiny. So if you could make the deposit $10,005, do that, because that's definitely not structuring. It, the uh, CTR will get filed, and nobody would, um, would think that you're structuring because you're, you're doing the opposite, as you mentioned. We've had guests on our show who were stopped for civil forfeiture reasons, and in this particular case, they were not physically searched. They, uh, they had a considerable amount of money in their pockets, mm -hmm. which the police were not after at all while the police were looking at the car. Mm -hmm. In general, if it's a small enough amount, say twenty or 30000 that you can have it in your pockets rather than in the glove box or in the spare tire or blah, 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 is money in your pocket any safer at a traffic stop civil forfeiture wise than money hidden elsewhere not necessarily from a legal standpoint but from a practical standpoint it might be a little bit I have also heard of situations where people have had their bags or vehicle uh, searched but not their person um, and even you know women with purses uh, I've uh, I've had uh, potential clients where the officer went through their luggage but not their purse didn't ask how much money was in their wallet um, so, yes, that, uh, that could potentially um, enable you to not uh, you know, have the police discover the money when they search you. However, I would caution that um, having the money on your person could be considered an additional element of probable cause because um, as unusual as it might be for someone to carry around twenty or $30,000 in sort of normal life outside of uh, gambling or certain other um, businesses that require a lot of cash, um, it's even more unusual, I think, to, to have that money on your person rather than in a briefcase or something like it. Um, so there's kind of a, a plus and a minus to it. Um, I think police typically do search uh, someone's person, but they, um, they don't have to, and sometimes they forget or are just focused on you know, looking in the car for hidden compartments or something like that and not on the person themselves. So it's kind of a, a decision you have to make yourself about um, what you feel comfortable with. Uh, but, you know, there is some chance uh, the police will not, will not search your person and uh, there is some chance they will not notice that your pockets are, you know, perhaps bulging a little bit with, with uh, stacks of money. And if so, uh, then you know that money obviously wouldn't be seized and forfeited. There's also the possibility they consider that to be highly suspicious and um, you know an element of probable cause to justify the seizure. So 
it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of circumstance, but um, I think your listeners can probably play the odds as they see fit. It seems that yeah. there had been a, a trend away from this at the federal level for a period of time. Uh, is, that, is that true? And, um, and what about the state level and on down? So there was um, a period uh, during the late Obama administration when Attorney General Holder um, had shut down part of the equitable sharing program, which is a, a federal program where the federal government um, participates with lo uh, local and state governments to do civil forfeitures under federal law. And so uh, under equitable sharing, um, cities and states can turn seizures over to the federal government to process as forfeitures. And the, the, the name equitable sharing comes from the fact that if the forfeiture is successful, uh, DOJ keeps 20% uh, of the money that is seized and 80% goes back to um, the, the state or local law enforcement agency. Um, what Eric Holder shut down was, was one part of that um, program called adoptive uh, sharing, and those are situations where the, the federal or state or the uh, local or state law enforcement agency has not had any prior arrangement with the feds about equitable sharing. It's just kind of a one-off thing. They have a big seizure or for whatever reason they don't want to do the seizure under state law um, and they contact uh, the feds and they say, hey, would you like to take this over? Those uh, seizures and forfeitures make up only about 10 to 20 percent of the federal equitable sharing program. The vast majority of those seizures are part of joint task force seizures where there's already a relationship between local and state law enforcement and their federal partners and they usually have uh, some sort of agreement that they've entered into uh, that governs how seized property will be handled and roughly 80 to 90 percent of federal seizure federal equitable sharing seizures are done as task force seizures not adoptive seizures that program was not discontinued under the obama administration and under um, Eric Holder's new policy. So what, what Eric Holder changed was, um, was not insignificant, but it was a pretty small change in the grand scheme of things. And that also did not change federal forfeiture policy um, at the purely federal level. If it's federal agents seizing property, none of that uh, was affected by uh, Attorney General Holder's policy. Despite that being a fairly minor change in the grand scheme of things, uh, when the Trump administration came in, um, the decision was made uh, to reverse that policy. And um, Jeff Sessions, uh, the Attorney General at the time, uh, was very much a proponent of civil forfeiture. In fact, probably one of the most prominent uh, proponents of civil forfeiture. And so he didn't think uh, that, that there should be really <laughs> any constraints on, on what DOJ could do and rescinded the previous policy that Attorney General Holder had adopted. And so um, that has gone back into effect. Adoptive sharing um, forfeitures um, do continue now. Um, in terms of uh, whether that trickled down to the state and local level, obviously during the, and I think it was about a year and a half or two year period, uh, when these adoptive sharing um, seizures weren't available, uh, that that certainly led to a reduction in the number of <laughs> of those kinds of seizures. It was nearly zero. I think there may have been a few instances where there were some some paperwork uh, mess ups, but um, in general, you know, for a time being, the local and state law enforcement could not do those adoptive sharing seizures with the feds. So that meant they either had to partner with the task force or process it under state law. Um, that's no longer the case. They can continue doing that um, after uh, Attorney General Sessions uh, changed the policy back to the way it was before. Um, so policy-wise, not a lot has changed at the federal level. Um, w there was a change this summer. Uh, President Trump signed into law a bill that Congress passed that restricted the ability of IRS to engage in seizures of funds for structuring um, when they didn't have any suspicions that the source of the money was illegal. So that's called legal source structuring. 
um, that's what was happening with a lot of my clients who you know, were um, gas stations, grocery stores, that sort of thing, that were having cash seized. There was no suspicion that the source of the cash was illegal. We all knew it came from the business. But they said, well, it doesn't matter. You're still violating the structuring laws by you know, making these daily deposits. The IRS changed its policy on that several years ago, um, four or five years ago, changed its policy. But just like, the, uh, just like the policy change at DOJ that got changed by Attorney General Holder and then changed back by Attorney General Sessions, it was only a policy change at IRS. And we kept saying, look, um, this could be changed back at any time. And so Congress finally, uh, this summer in July, I believe, uh, signed into law, um, uh, I think it was called the Respect Act, uh, that um, made it so that IRS cannot engage in those legal source structuring seizures. But that, that is a very small you know, niche category of all the types of federal forfeitures out there. And federal for forfeiture continues pretty much unabated. At the state level, about half of states have reformed their forfeiture laws in one way or another. Um, some of those are pretty small reforms, pretty superficial. Maybe they've imposed uh, reporting requirements on law enforcement agencies, so there's more transparency about what they're seizing, who they're seizing it from, how they're spending the money, that kind of thing. But a number of states have also passed pretty meaningful and substantive reforms. Nebraska and New Mexico have essentially abolished civil forfeiture in their state and also passed laws that um, are called anti-circumvention laws that don't allow the feds to do equitable sharing with local and state law enforcement in those states. Uh, a number of other states, there's now about 13, now require a criminal conviction before civil forfeiture can be done. So that's a pretty significant change, um, and that's really come about just in the past four or five years. So there's a lot of movement with legislation at the state level. Um, there hasn't yet been a big breakthrough at the federal level. Um, all of that being said, we've been bringing as much attention as we can to this issue um, since 2014. And there's definitely been a reduction in the total number of civil forfeitures, both at the federal level and in most states since that time. We don't really know what to trace it to. We don't know if just by fluke 2014 was the peak year. But for whatever reason, there has been a decline in the number of forfeitures um, across the federal agencies and in most states um, since 2014. There are some flukes here and there. but. Um, it is, it is somewhat on the downturn, which we find encouraging, but we'd really like to uh, have it on a downturn to zero. Yeah. Um, are there any states that um, you could tell us you, that you would consider sort of worst offenders still? <laughs> Boy, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are plenty of we have a We have a report out called Policing for Profit, uh, you can find it on our website or just Google Policing for Profit Report. Um, the second edition is out currently. That was published in November of 2015. We're going to do a third edition next year in November 2020, but that's not, not, it's not available yet. Uh, but we give a grade to every state in our Policing for Profit Report. And so you can go to that report, and we're grading the state laws um, based on the standards uh, for forfeiture in those states and whether police get to keep um, the proceeds from the crime, or the proceeds from the forfeiture, rather. And so um, you can go and see the, the letter grade for, for any state you like. Um, I will say that because of all the reforms in the past several years, there, uh, some of those uh, grades are no longer accurate. In most cases, they would be better than... Uh, what they are currently because they've imposed, they've enacted a positive reform. Um, we do have a website, endforfeiture.org, that tracks all of that legislative activity. So if you want to know um, what the situation is in a given state, uh, you could both look it up in Policing for Profit and see, you know, what grade we gave it in 2015. Um, so if you wanted to look at, I don't know, say Nevada, for instance, um, you would say, oh, Nevada gets uh, a D minus in its civil forfeiture laws as of 2015 because um, as much as 100% of forfeiture proceeds go to law enforcement. Um, the, um, let's see, the, there were some reforms in uh, 2015, but uh, they, they didn't go very far. So um, 
the standard to forfeit property in Nevada under state law is clear and convincing evidence, which is a bit higher than the preponderance of the evidence standard at the federal level and in most states. So that's good. Um, but the fact that um, there are there are 100% of forfeiture proceeds go to law enforcement is uh, a real problem. Uh, Nevada does have the benefit of requiring a criminal conviction as a prerequisite to forfeit property. So um, that's good. Uh, it, it means it's more difficult for police to forfeit property, but don't feel totally safe by that because the criminal conviction does not have to be of the owner of the property. It could be a criminal conviction of someone else. So if you loan someone your car, they use it for something illegal, the police can still forfeit the car if they get a criminal conviction of the person who was driving it, even though the car belongs to you. Um, and um, Nevada uh, has poor protections for innocent third prop third-party property owners, the, the sort of situation I described where you loan someone your car, um, you have the burden of proving your own innocence in that circumstance, to prove you're an innocent owner, which is obviously very difficult to do. You have to show you had no idea that the person was going to commit a crime with the vehicle or whatever other property you let them borrow, and it's obviously pretty hard to prove a negative, um, so saddling innocent owners with that burden gives uh, Nevada, with all of the other um, factors, uh, a D minus. You can take a look at any state in our guide, and then you could also visit endforfeiture.org and see if any more recent reforms have been passed since we published this guide in November of 2015. And although the, the online tracker at endforfeiture.org doesn't, doesn't give a live updated grade, you can sort of get a sense of, of what it's like uh, based on, you know, any new reforms that have, that have been passed since then. The South Point has more than 10,000 games returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In October, the promotion is free play with a kicker. Usually free play is eligible to be picked up Tuesdays through Thursdays weekly. In October, your normal free play may be picked up Monday through Wednesday. If you pick that up, you'll get the same amount either Friday or Saturday of the same week. Do this four weeks in a row, meaning eight free play pickups. You get a double-sized free play pickup on Monday, October 28th. Week 7, October 15th, of the free video poker classes at the South Point, Silverado Lounge, noon, Tuesday, will be our one advanced week of the of the semester. This time from 12 to 2, we'll be doing advanced 9-6 jacks or better. From 2 to 3.30, we'll be doing advanced 9-6 bonus poker deluxe. These are two games where it is possible for the player to get actually perfect advanced strategy with a reasonable amount of effort, whereas games like Deuces Wild and certain others are basically impossible to play at the perfect level. Now, 9-6 Jacks are better and 9-6 Bonus Poker Deluxe are very similar strategies, and at the advanced level, there are a few things that are the same, but there are other things that are specific to the game. You will learn all about penalty cards and even if these aren't your games, if you, you'll be able to apply the information you learned to other games as well. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. Game of the week is Spin Poker Deluxe. It's the same as Spin Poker, which has nine lines active, except Spin Poker Deluxe has 20 lines active, making it a 100 coins per play game. The expected value and the strategy of this game is exactly the same as the base game. We have two new sponsors at Gambling with an Edge. First one is predictit.org. 
you should listen to last week's show where we interview Flip on exactly how predicted.org works. If you sign up uh, through us, you get a, a promotion bonus. And the way to sign up is predictit.org slash promo slash edge. And that link will be in the show notes. And a brand new sponsor today is blackjackapprenticeship.com. It's an organization run by Colin Jones, dedicated to teaching you how to play and win at Blackjack. So this is the first time we've done one of these commercials for Blackjack Apprenticeship. So uh, Richard, what do you think about the organization? Well, um, first I just want to say we kind of recommend them a lot and have been for a long time. So we're happy actually that they're becoming a sponsor because we were doing it for free in the past because both Bob and I are sort of uh, big fans of Collins. Um, we have a lot of people who have gone through uh, his Blackjack Boot Camp or are members of Blackjack Apprenticeship that have been on the show. Um, these are people who learned to count cards and have gone out and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, people ask a lot about how do I meet other players because I've talked about how important it is to network with other players. And so um, his forum, Blackjack Apprenticeship, uh, is a place where you're going to meet other players, mostly players that are serious, and, uh, and it is a pay site. But because of that, there's a lot less of the just random crap and political rants than what you would find on the free forums. So... Um, yeah, so we're happy to have him as a sponsor. And I also recommend his book. He just has a new book out called 21st Century Card Counter. Um, which, which we spoke about here a little over a month ago. And we're going to be doing lots of these commercials for Black Jap Apprenticeship, but every other, every other week. And so you'll get more details about how it works in future commercials. I just want to add one thing about the predicted.org. Um, the bonus that they're giving you is you deposit $20, and they will give you a matching $20 bonus. So, um, yeah, that, that's the deal if you go sign up through our link. Very good. So let's go back and talk to Dan. If one of our listeners – is a victim of civil forfeiture, and they think their case might be suitable for your organization to look at, yep. how would they proceed? Well, they should contact us. Um, we have a, um, a form on our website where you can, um, and our website is ij.org, just the letters I and J, as in Institute for Justice, ij.org. Um, if you go to ij.org, there's uh, a form that you can fill out to report abuse. Um, you can fill out a potential client form and let us know uh, what happened to you. Um, if it's civil forfeiture related, we actually have a specific form uh, for civil forfeiture that, that gets additional information so that we know like, what the forfeiting agency is or what the seizing agency is. Um, at, we ask you know, specific questions about the, the facts of the case, the, the location of the seizure, that sort of thing. And... Um, and then we will review it and we'll contact you if we think it's a potentially promising case. We have a, a gentleman named Adam uh, Linthicum, who is our forfeiture intake coordinator. He spends uh, all of his time uh, basically looking at these um, potential clients who send in uh, forms uh, and calling them and getting more information, getting their documents, and then meeting with attorneys about their potential case to see if we think it's um, worth going forward, and you know, if it is, then we follow up with the person and and try to arrange uh, a time to talk, and you know, sort of go go through their case and find out kind of how comfortable they are with uh, you know potentially being uh, featured in uh, our media uh, efforts. Because one of the things we do at IJ is we don't just litigate cases in 
um, the court of law. We also litigate them in the court of public opinion. And so one thing that I know might make some of your listeners uncomfortable is, you know, we try to get our clients in the news. We, you know, would love them to be on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times. We'd love them to be on, you know, the NBC Nightly News or CNN or whatever outlet is interested, and often uh, especially local outlets are interested when we launch a case. And so part of our efforts to win a case are to bring public pressure through the media, let people know that this is going on, that it's a real serious problem. Um, and so we do that through media, outra- media outreach. And it's an important part of how we litigate our cases. Um, I know, you know for some gamblers, they don't particularly want lots of attention or publicity, uh, but that's just uh, how we operate. Um, we also provide referrals. If, if it turns out, for whatever reason, we wouldn't be a good fit to represent someone, we are in touch with a number of forfeiture t- attorneys across the country, some of which might be willing to represent people pro bono in the right circumstances. Others will um, charge a fee, um, and you know we can put people in touch with those attorneys if we think the case is, is maybe not a good fit for us, but you know, everyone deserves representation, and, and um, you know, there are plenty of people out there with, with good cases that, you know, don't want to go public with it, or there's various other things going on in their lives that would, would make it not a, not a very good uh, IJ case, but still a winnable case that, um, you know, we can help them find an attorney who might be able to win it for them. If someone wished to make a donation to the Institute for Justice because they think you do good work, how would they go about that? Uh, probably, again, the easiest way would be to go to our website, ij.org, and um, there is a place where you can click on at the top, Give Now. It's right next to the Report Abuse button. Report Abuse if you have a case. Give Now if you'd like to donate. Um, we'd certainly appreciate your donation. Go to ij.org, click on Give Now, and uh, your money will, will uh, support us as we um, you know, continue to fight the good fight to try to put an end to civil forfeiture. All right. We only have a few minutes left because you are have an important phone call immediately after you hang up with us. But since we're talking about phones, if you were in a traffic stop and you had a lot of money, mm-hmm. in general, would it be a good idea to turn on an iPhone camera on video so it's basically just recording the voice that's going on and just laying it on the seat of your car and let it record for as long as the police are there. In general, would that be a smart idea or a really stupid idea? In general, I think that would be a really good idea. Um, But let me offer a couple uh, caveats and um, a suggestion about how to do that. First, the suggestion about how to do that. The ACLU has an app that you can download that allows you to record police incidents, any encounter uh, between citizens and police. And they encourage people to just do it even if they're not the ones involved in the encounter. If you're a bystander, record the interaction in case something goes wrong. Um, the, the, you can just download it for free on the App Store or you know, however, you, however you download something, Apple Store, whatever it is. I'm sure there's a version available for your device. What's good about that is it immediately uploads the video so that even if your phone is seized and everything on it is deleted, that video is uploaded to the cloud um, and a website that the ACLU would make available to you and your attorney or whomever else in case the phone is seized. So that is, um, that's the important thing to know. The other thing that you should know is that um, although most courts have, have generally held that a police officer is not, not entitled to privacy while they're engaged in law enforcement activity. Not every court has held that. And that means that some courts uh, have found that police, order, police officers are entitled to privacy. And in some states that are, um, that are called two-party consent states, you could theoretically be prosecuted for recording a police officer without their knowledge. There there are basically two types of states. There's one-party consent states and two-party consent states. Most states are one-party consent states. As long as one of the parties to a conversation consents, they can record the conversation. If none of the parties consent, that that means you're just eavesdropping, and and that's uh, typically illegal. Um, but if at least one of the party consents, um, you can record the, the conversation. 
in a handful of states, I think it's maybe nine states, they are two-party consent states. And you have to have consent from both and or all of the parties in the conversation in order to record the conversation. In those states, potentially, uh, you could be prosecuted for something like wiretapping um, or, or violations of privacy um, for recording a police officer without their consent. I think you would have a very strong uh, criminal defense that uh, a police officer is not entitled to privacy when they are uh, pulling you over in a traffic stop or some other thing where they're engaged in law enforcement activity. If, though, you were just recording a police officer, I don't know, um, maybe on a break or uh, somebody who's an off-duty police officer who's uh, you know, just at a bar or at a concert or something like that, and they didn't consent to it and you're recording their conversation uh, surreptitiously, um, that could be potentially problematic. But I think that's a pretty different circumstance than what you're talking about, where a police officer is pulling you over on the side of the road, or you're otherwise engaged in some kind of um, uh, stop by a police officer. In those circumstances, yes, I think it would be a very good idea to um, hit record, ideally on the ACLU recording app, so that you can get video and or audio of what happens, and it would be uploaded live uh, via streaming to the ACLU's cloud, and you don't have to worry if your phone is, is seized as part of the stop. Thank you, Dan. I would, just add, that I would just add the ACLU app uh, blasts your screen also, so you don't know that, that the recording is going on if you look at the phone. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great feature, and I strongly recommend people downloading it and using it, not just when you're stopped, but if you, if you see a police stop and you have time to record it, I recommend doing so, because that's how we find out about police abuse. Thank you, Dan Album, Institute for Justice. We know you have another phone call to take. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. At the end of our shows recently, Richard and I have been doing a recommended section. Today it is my turn. And there's fewer lounge acts in Las Vegas than there used to be. The one that Bonnie and I like the most is Wes Winters at the South Point. Wes Winters is a piano player and singer with a huge variety of music that most people older than 40 know all the songs, and the younger ones know some of the songs. There's dance floors, and many people get up and dance. And you can sit and enjoy the music for free. There's bar service, and it's a pleasant evening. We go regularly, depending on what else is happening on our lives. It's Friday and Saturday night, 6.30 to 9.00 and sometimes six to nine, and it's hard to know which is which. And there's a lot of regulars there. It's a lot of fun. We enjoy it. So actually, you're bringing that up. Um, I, my recommended is actually something else, but you're mentioning that made me think of um, the Italian-American club on Saturday and Sunday nights um, yes. has J Jerry Tiffy in the lounge. And yes, uh, I know Jerry. talk about... Old, old school Las Vegas, you know, sort of Frank Sinatra, Rat Pack kind of music, uh, and, and a lot of old time Vegas type characters at the Italian American Club. So that, that's a place that I like to go sometimes on Saturday or Sunday night. Um, but my recommended for this week is uh, uh, the television show that I'm currently into, um, which is called Mind Hunter. It's on Netflix. Um, there are two seasons of it, and it is based on the uh, formation of the behavioral science unit of the FBI that first uh, came up with the term serial killers. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good show. So that's, uh, that's the show I'm currently obsessed with, so uh, I can recommend that this week. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>